So we have read Matthew. And as I mentioned, uh, I looked at Matthew 5 and 6, and those are nice, warm, loving, concerning, and caring kinds of messages that Jesus gave. We don't know if the message is 5, 6, and 7, or, or, or there's several messages within those chapters. But uh, it just seems like a different crowd when we open up to chapter 7. And it seems like there's something else going on. The mood changes, the tenor of the changes, uh, the tone of Jesus' conversation changes, and it seems like they've got some new people uh, joining him there and listening to what he has to say. And I think as you go through it with me, you'll come to realize who these people are. They are the religious. They are the Pharisees. They are the lawyers of the law, the teachers of the law that are there, and they essentially are spying on him, and they don't say that here in this or who this here, but we see all through the gospel that uh, Jesus has been, is being spied on constantly. And they're always refuting and arguing and debating with him. And so Jesus now has come to a place where he needs to speak clearly to these folks who are there. And he says, be careful when you're judging for with the same judgment that you use, the same attitude and the same way that you judge others, you too will be judged. And that just seems like a contrast to the chapters 5 and 6 where Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see the kingdom of heaven. And so here, Jesus is getting down to business. And he's saying to the religious bunch that are there that they need to be careful because they are easy to judge. And they judge Jesus. They judge the disciples. And he said, with the same judgment that you use, you too will be judged. And then we move on farther in chapter 7, and Jesus uh, begins to talk about this thing called virtue that I have called virtue. He said, if you want to have a relationship with God, if you want to have the very characteristics that God desires in our life, you have to ask, seek, and knock. And, and I thought many have taken that to mean, you know, if you have needs in your life, just go ahead and ask and God will, will take care of that. But that's not what he is asking for. He is asking us to take on the very virtues of himself, Christ. And the virtues of those characteristics, those traits that God has given to Christ that he wants us to have in our own life that make us who we are. Strong, powerful, uh, faithful people who have characteristics are, that are in our life like Christ himself. He is our model, and he is the one we want to model our life after. And so to have that in your life, we need to ask, we need to seek, and we need to knock. And Jesus says in here, the word's not used, but there's a persistence in there. We, we can't stop, we can't ask. And, and the things we need to be praying for is the ability perhaps to love one another. And if I don't love people the way I should, I need to ask, Lord, help me to love that person. I, I don't like them, but help me to love them in the way that you love them. I know you died for them, and I want to have the same love. And so I want to keep knocking, Lord, you, are you hearing me? This is what I want in my life. I want your love in my life. I, I want your joy in my life. And so I need to be knocking constantly. It's a continuous thing that goes on. And we become like Christ, having the very virtues of Christ that make Christ stand out in the community and make him stand out in our lives so people can see Christ in our lives. Now we get down to this other thing. Enter through the narrow gate, Jesus said, for wide is the great and broad is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. Both small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only few find it. That suggests to me that we're talking about a highly disciplined life. A life that's really regulated by the power of God within us and our desire to be like Christ. And so we need to walk this narrow road. And sometimes I, I wonder sometimes if I'm on the side of that narrow road down to the bank or maybe I'm just a little bit on the over here, and then on Sundays I'm back over here looking pretty good, but the rest of the week I might be over here on this broad road just having a good old time like everybody is. And Jesus is not talking to those who are non-religious. We all know that those who are on the wide road, they're going to this place they don't want to go. Jesus said destruction, ruin, is at the end of this. And so we might believe, we might think that these are just Normal people who are just lost. You know, don't, don't worry too much about them because they're on the broad 
Broadway and there's, there's just no hope for them at all. But Jesus is not talking to those people. He's talking to you and I. He's talking to religious people. He's talking to people of faith. He's talking to people who know God, say they know God, but perhaps don't have the right relationship. He says, so really, he's really saying is get your, get your life straight. He says, I have a disciplined life I want you to follow. You continue to follow your religious ways over here and you're going to have trouble. You know, we seem to believe that if we, <clears throat> life is better with Jesus, and how many would agree with that? Life is always better with Jesus. It, it, it's kind of like things always go better with Coke. I mean, can you see the similarity? Life goes better with Jesus, things go better with Coke. Uh, but is that true? Does life always go better with Jesus? Sometimes it's not the way it is, is it? I want you to know something. The world is broken. Everything in the world is broken. And life is hard. And seemingly impossible. So how can life be better with Jesus? It might not be better. It might be difficult. It is going to be difficult. In fact, Jesus told us, narrow is the road. Narrow is the gate. You have to follow a pretty disciplined life. And that's not easy. If we are on that narrow road, we will be making decisions, having to make tough decisions. Getting too much change from the cashier, cashier, for example. We can get in the car and say, well, that's my just good fortune today, and charge on down the road. But as we get down the road, there should be somebody speaking to you. You know, that's not right. That's dishonest. You are to be walking on this narrow road. You have no right to be walking on the broad road of life, which is going to to the end, to destruction, but you need to do that. And when God begins to speak with you, you turn the car around, you go back, you can be assured that you are on the narrow road. You're traveling through the narrow gate and on the narrow road because God is talking to you about who you are and your life. You'll be struggling with all kinds of issues in life. Thankfully, I have the Holy Spirit and I have Becky. And she's speaking more to me now than the Holy Spirit is. <clears throat> and I thank the Lord for that. So when there's somebody comes up, something comes up on TV that I ought not to be watching, she is just all over me. And she makes a lot of noise until I act upon that. Sometimes I'd like to just leisurely change the channel, but she makes certain that I change it in a hurry. And that only says one thing. When we do that, we are trying to stay on that narrow road. There are some who say that we can have victory in Christ, right? Victory in Jesus every day. Is that true? Yeah. Is it? Do you have victory in Jesus every single day? Tell me about the last five victories you've had. <laughs> they do come, and that is true, but not all the time. Life is hard. We need to understand that life is hard. And the reason we need Christ, because life is hard. We draw on his power. We use the faith that he gives us to walk that narrow road and do what he has called us to do. There are some who say that you can have your best life now. In fact, that, that's the title of a book. And as I look at that, I think, best life now? And the way I guess I get that best life is follow these seven steps. And if I follow these seven steps, then I'll have the big house, the big car, and life will be good. And I will be on the narrow road. But you know, you can't have your best life now because our best life is yet to come. We will go through hardship and difficulty in this life, hoping that one day we'll be in the presence of God. And he will then give us our best life later. So if we are attempting to have our best life now, we might be disappointed because we won't get the best life later. We've got to submit We've got to be obedient. We have got to be exactly what God has called us to do. And sometimes that is hard, very hard and difficult. But still know this, that Jesus is always there giving you the power, giving you the direction and guiding you in the way that you should go. So you're not walking down that road alone. You're walking along that road with, with the word. You're walking along that road with the Holy Spirit who lives within you, helping you to stay on that road. But every once in a while, it's just kind of nice to, Kind of step over here and have a look around, isn't it? How many admit that? I'm going to open the altar here if you don't start raising your hands. <laughs> Come on. I don't want to step on that accent. But you do. No, no. 
Yes, we do. We all do. We don't want to, but sometimes we get into that place, and God is always there if, if, if bringing you back to the narrow road that he wants us to walk on. Some of us say that happiness comes with a Christian faith, but does it? Come on, raise your hand if you agree with me. Happy does come with the Christian faith, right? There we got one back there. Come on up here, Mike. We're going to change your mind. We'll pray for you. Happiness comes with the Holy Spirit living within us. Remember? Love, joy, peace, patience. That will bring us a, a joyful kind of a life. Not necessarily a happy life. And I, I think we should have happy lives that come from the joy of God living within us. But that doesn't mean we don't live without disappointment. Disappointment is real. And God can use that disappointment in our lives to change the way we think, change our perspective, and give us a whole new outlook on what he has for us. <clears throat> these are tough questions. You know, Solomon wrestled with these questions. If you go back and look in Ecclesiastes, especially if you're having a bad day, you better get over to my house and we spend the time together. And I'll encourage you so you can read that. Because there's some things in there that Solomon says that, oh, I just don't like to hear about that. Uh, I just don't want to talk about that. And if you turn to Ecclesiastes, he's, uh, what he writes there right behind the Psalms in there someplace. Let me just hit a couple of them for you and then we'll, we'll move on. Just be thankful that I'm not Solomon here preaching to you today. So he, he would be saying this, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless in life. Okay, let's sing the last hymn and go home. That certainly won't give us much hope, will it? But, but Ecclesiastes, or I mean Solomon was a man, a, a great thinking, great thinker. And he, as he wrote this, he began to really struggle with the whole idea of wisdom. He said, wisdom is meaningless. Um, toil or work is meaningless. Um, he has questions about oppression and the lack of friendliness. He has questions about riches and how they really don't make you happy. He said advancing, get, get, getting promoted at work doesn't make you happy. And he continues on and he finally concludes with this. After all this struggle, he says in chapter 12 in Ecclesiastes, Solomon says this, now all that has been heard, here's the conclusion of the, conclusion of the matter. After all this thinking about what life is really like, and I know in my own life, when I get promoted, I'm happy for two weeks. Or when I get something new, I'm happy for maybe two weeks. Uh, it just doesn't last. And that's what Solomon's really getting at. This stuff that we do doesn't really last. And so he comes to this. Here it is. Write this down or look this up in your Bible. He said, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Two things. Fear God and keep his commandments. After all that thought and all that writing, that's what he comes down to. And I like that. For God will bring... Every deed into judgment, including the hidden thing, whether it's evil, good, or evil. So we need to fear God, keep his commandments, because it's our duty to do so to God, knowing full well that one day we will stand before God and he will judge us. And I'm sure he had many questions that were not answered even in his own life. The road is narrow. The road is hard. The road requires that we wrestle with issues like this in life and that we deal with these issues or they'll get away from us and they'll become a huge problem in our life. And what he is really saying here uh, in conclusion in Ecclesiastes, make your single purpose in life to know God. We make that our single purpose. He will bless us in every single way. The second thing he says is enjoy life within the confines of the Bible, within the confines of God's commandments. Enjoy life. Make that a priority. And many times we think we enjoy life when we're out working all the time, and I went through this a time of my life, when the real joy is at home with my family. I'm coming to the place in my own life. I want to spend more time with my 
family. That's where the joy really is. With my church family, with my, my, uh, my physical family. And then the third thing he says here is search for purpose and meaning and recognize that whatever you do on this earth, whatever you do in this life has no meaning at all. We cannot find satisfaction in the, in, the, in the things that we do. We get to that place, we kind of get tired of it, and we want to give up, and all of a sudden we look back and it's just a mess again. It takes a lot of work to keep something up and keep it going, to keep a house in perfectly constant repair. And, but the, in the end, you die and you stand before God. So he is saying, live a life with purpose and with meaning, and that means we seek, seek to know God and we serve him at the same time that we acknowledge the evil and that the injustice, we, we acknowledge the injustices in the world and we maintain a positive attitude toward God and a strong faith in God. Do those things and we will have a blessed life. I think that's the conclusion that Solomon comes to in Ecclesiastes. All people will have to stand before God everybody, and to give an account for everything they say, everything they do, good or evil, in life. And we will not be able to use the inequities in life, the imbalances in life, the injustices of life as an excuse before God. But God, wait a minute, I was born in poverty. Oh, wait a minute, I never had a great job. Now, wait a minute, God, you can't do these things. You can't judge me like that. And that's not what God will say. You can't use those as excuses. I gave you a standard, asked you to be faithful and follow. Walk on that narrow road. That's what I'm going to judge you on. We must put God first, now and forever, knowing that human effort apart from God is, is pointless. That God will judge every person's life that every good gift is from God. And with this mind, Jesus in mind, Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. What is destruction? That's separation from God. That comes to a place where nothing is left, destroyed. And he said, many enter through it. Becky says, I shudder at this verse. The fact that we could be on the broad road where it leads to destruction, and many could be going down that road. And then Jesus even complicates it even more in verse 14 when he said, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few people find it. So we need to make every effort to walk on that narrow road, calling upon God to give us what it is we need to walk on that road, to walk on that road, and to be faithful to God in everything that we do. And when God's Spirit convicts us, we go, we follow the leading of the Lord, and we make things right with that one that we have offended. We make things right with other people that we have had hard feelings with over the years. We are always called to walk on that narrow road, be honest in everything you do, and be a person of great integrity, be a person of genuine love, caring for everybody, be a holy man like Christ. And he is our example. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done. And Lord, we really thank you for the time we've had together here. And we ask your blessing as we go our way. Lord, remember that, uh, help us to remember that life is hard and that there are things that we need to work through with you. But Lord, we all always know that you will never leave us or forsake us in all the trials of life and all the things that you bring our way to change our character and to change our virtues. So help us, Father, to become just like Christ in every way. Help us to recognize our, our sin and to confess those. And help us, Father, to overcome some habitual sins that we struggle with each and every day and week and sometimes month. It seems like, Lord, sometimes these sins are so great they just won't go away. But, Father, we know that you call us to ask, to seek, and to keep on knocking that these things would disappear in our lives. So bless us as we go. Help us, Father, to love one another and help us to find the greatest joy in our church family and our families at home. Bless each of us as we go this day in Jesus' holy name. Amen.